Well, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the Northboro Free Library. I'm Chris Lindquist. I'm the director here at the library, and I'm really pleased to have this uh, two-part uh, seminar, two-part series on planning to stay at home in Northboro as you slow down. Uh, I, I'm really happy because the library over the past uh, 18 months or so has been involved in the Dementia Friendly Initiative right here in Northboro. <laughs> Are, are some of you familiar with that initiative that's happening here? The Senior Center has taken a lead on that. The library is a partner, uh, social <laughs> services. And so we're really happy that the library is kind of involved in that um, effort. And one of the things we're doing, I just wanted to mention, um, we, are, we now offer a, um, a memory cafe on the first Monday of the month uh, here at the library in this very room. Uh, it's from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. So for those who have dementia or cognitive issues or their caregivers, it's a wonderful respite. Uh, Carol D. Rienzo, some of you may know, is involved. And uh, she is uh, hope, you know, really hoping to, uh, I guess, gain an audience for that. We've had, uh, over the past year, a number of people who are coming to that um, memory cafe. And memory cafes are uh, happening throughout Massachusetts. There's about 70 of them right now. Uh, Massachusetts is an, a, leader, a leader in that initiative, and libraries and restaurants and others are places where people can come for uh, respite. So it's, it's a great opportunity if you know of anyone who has cognitive issues or dementia. Uh, we are also starting a new initiative here at the library called Library uh, on the Go, and it's an outreach service for those who need delivery of library materials to their homes. So if you know of somebody who is in their homes and they have transportation issues or they're temporarily or permanently uh, disabled, we will deliver materials to their homes. And we have a grant from the Board of Library Commissioners that's enabling us to do that. And uh, we have volunteers like Stephane here in the front row who are helping to deliver materials to those who are in need. And so any materials that you can get at the library, we will deliver to people's homes. And we have a new outreach services coordinator, Rick Starzik. So if, if you know of anybody who's either temporarily or permanently disabled, has transportation issues, what have you. There's no age restrictions. So anyone who needs um, information and materials from the library can get those uh, through the Library As You Go program. And so I'm just here to welcome Arthur and um, to really just uh, welcome you to this series. I, I'm you know, fascinated by uh, what Arthur's gonna tell us and, and I'm interested to partner with him and to do some future uh, programs just like this. So please help me welcome Arthur Bergeron. Hello. Thank you. Have a seat here. So uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for inviting me here. Um, thanks to the folks from uh, the cable TV. Uh, I, what I, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Mario O'Connell. There are 70 of us. We've got a boatload of attorneys. And so everybody kind of gets to do what they like doing, and this is what I do. I do nothing but elder law. But I do a lot of presentations at senior centers, but the kind of the rule is I always want to make sure there's cable there because so many people who need to see this can't see this because they can't get here because they're at home, you know, because they're, they're taking care of somebody or whatever. So I really appreciate that. I also just want to mention, this is the first presentation we've done here. I've done in Northboro in several years. Um, I hadn't met Chris until about a year ago. The things that are happening right here at the library are just great. The two things that he mentioned, the memory cafe, the person who invented memory cafes actually lives here in, um, or memory cafes in Massachusetts, lives here. A woman named Tammy Pazaricki, she lives in Northboro, uh, started the first one of these in Marlboro about eight years ago, and now there are, as Chris mentioned, about 70 of them. The idea behind a memory cafe is that if you've got memory issues, or if your partner has memory issues, and you want to take a couple of hours to come to a place, listen to some music, do some other stuff, be in a relaxed atmosphere, that's the point of it. That's the point of it. For folks who want to get out of the house, somebody may have a memory issue, but you want to be at a place where you're feeling safe, not threatened, not embarrassed, that's the point of the Memory Cafe. And, 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 and Chris and the library folks here have been gracious enough to sponsor that. The other is the program that he was just talking about, this notion of actually get, delivering books to folks at home <laughs> from the library. What just a great idea. So, um, thank you for coming today. With me is Christine Alessandro from Bay Path Elder Services. Can you raise your hand if you've heard of Bay Path Elder Services? Oh, quite a few. That's good. That's good. So Christine is the executive director. Um, and so we wanted to do this pro a couple of programs together to talk to you a little bit about, a as a senior, as a, which I will define, you know, those definitions are all over the place, right? But I'll define it as somebody who is um, retired or about to retire, 60 to 65, 
or over and is trying to kind of figure things out, right? Kind of readjusting to life and stuff. Um, if you are in, in that situation, then you want to talk about the, you want to hear these programs. The first one dealing with folks who are healthy and mobile and everything is great. And then the second one dealing with folks who may be having some more problems, whether they're physical problems or memory problems or whatever, we'll be doing that presentation next month. So um, uh, the, the example that when I, when I was used to do presentations um, are my, my friends uh, Frank and Mary. Uh, Frank and Mary are 65 years old. Uh, they have three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, I always tell people, if you're old enough to get that joke, you're old enough to be my client, right? <laughs> so, so, and they have a very simple goal. They're their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and they have a very simple goal. Um, oh, and, and this is their assets. They own a house, right? They own it jointly. They have a joint bank account. Frank has, an, if we're, yeah, the house is worth about 400000 It's not a big house. It's not small. Um, they have a joint bank account, $100,000. Frank has an IRA. Uh, Frank has an annuity with Mary as the beneficiary. Uh, and that's worth about 200000 and their total value is just under a million dollars. And their basic estate plan is simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. If one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other one. If the other one dies, they want to leave everything to their kids. Does this sound like a familiar kind of estate plan to you, right? So the question is, if you're Frank and Mary and you are slowing down, uh, what do you need to be thinking about? What do you need to be doing? Well, first of all, um, what you don't need to be doing very much of is talking to your lawyer <laughs> in most cases, uh, unless you've had very specific concerns because if you're Frank and Mary and you own the assets that I just described and the way in which I described them and Frank dies, Mary simply becomes the owner of all the assets. There is no probate, there's none of those issues. You don't need a will, not, none of that stuff, right? So while you may want to talk to an attorney regarding some of those issues, if there's something unusual, oftentimes you don't need to. You don't need to, right, at that point, unless you've got other kinds of issues. What do you need to do? You only need to do a very few things. You have to have those three things. You have to have those three things. Healthcare proxy, medical authorization, power of attorney. You all know the first one and the third one. Why are you doing the second one exactly? Well, we're going to just talk about that for just a few minutes. So if you're doing a healthcare proxy, remember it has to have two witnesses. Copies are as valid as originals. You don't have to bring your original with you to the hospital or anything. Um, the best place to have that healthcare proxy is to give it to your doctor. Give it to your doctor so that if you end up in the emergency room or someplace, the doctor can just email it over. So there's a nice, easy place to get it. Remember that if you, that your power of attorney is automatically revoked if you revoke it. And by the way, you can revoke it um, anytime. There's a presumption of competence. Even if the doctor has said that you are not capable of making a medical decision. If you decide that you want to revoke your proxy, you can, and there's a presumption that you're competent to do that. So, so you have a lot of flexibility on, as far as that power of attorney, or, uh, the healthcare proxy is concerned. I also want to mention, if you sign a new healthcare proxy, that automatically revokes all the old ones. So if you have one at home that you signed because you had a big official one, you know, or you had your lawyer do work on it, and, and then you go to the hospital, and you're in the emergency room and the lady at the emergency room says, can you sign this for me while you're here? Because we want to make sure if there's a problem, you know, we're going to be okay. And you sign a new healthcare proxy. Well, technically you just revoked all the old ones. That's the reason why, you know, my suggestion is give the proxy to your doctor so the doctor can kind of send it in. Um, and, the, uh, and the reason why you want to do that, the only alternative to that is guardianship. <coughs> the only alternative to that is guardianship. <coughs> if you go into the hospital and your spouse is there, <coughs> and you can't make a medical decision and your spouse is, is going to make it for you, technically the doctor's not supposed to listen to your spouse, right? Legally, the doctor is not supposed to listen to your spouse, only to a person who has a proxy or to a guardian, right? Now doctors and hospitals have been very casual with that in past years, but you know the world is getting litigious and doctors are getting more nervous about this stuff and so you want to cover yourself by, by having that, that product. Because otherwise, if you're in the hospital and, and, the, and no one's willing to accept somebody else's opinion about how to treat you and the doctor has said you can't make a decision, someone has to go get a guardianship, uh, a guardian appointed. And that guardian is just going to be painful to get. It's going to cost thousands of dollars. It's going to take court time. It's all a big waste. The second thing you want is a HIPAA authorization or a medical authorization. The reason for that is, when you sign your health care proxy, um, what you're saying 
uh, is, that, is that if a doctor has said that you can't make a medical decision, from then on, whoever you've named in the proxy as your agent can make those decisions for you. You've also, in that pro once that kicks in, that person who is the proxy has the right to go talk to your doctor or to talk to the, the uh, hospital or whatever, right? Until it kicks in, though, that's not the case. So even if you have a healthcare proxy and you go to the hospital, and it hasn't been, it, the doctor has not said you're incompetent, right? But you're just in the hospital room and your spouse or one of your kids or whatever wants to talk to the doctor or the hospital, technically they can't do it, even if they're the person named on the proxy, because the proxy hasn't been, I can't remember the term, it's not activated. There's a make-believe term that all the doctors use for when the proxy goes into effect. But, and, and it's just a make-believe term. But, but until then, no one can talk to the doctor. So the way you deal, and only after that has gone into effect, unless you've otherwise authorized other people, only that person can talk to the doctor. So for those of you who have maybe a spouse, you know, that, that, that obviously would take care of things, and another child, or you have several children, and you want to have them all involved in that process if you're not well, well, you know, the proxy can, in your proxy, you can only name one person at a time, right? Because the doctor, if I'm the doctor, I only want to talk to one person. I don't want to hear your kids squabbling about how I'm going to take care of you, right? But you can authorize all of them. You can authorize all the kids to communicate with your doctor and to communicate with the hospital by doing separate HIPAA authorizations, right? Um, finally, you want to do a power of attorney. The power of attorney allows somebody to act on your behalf regarding all of your legal decisions, all decisions except your medical decisions. Uh, power of attorney, you do not require witnesses for that, right? Doesn't even have to be notarized, but you always want to do it. You always want to have it notarized. The reason is, I, I've, I've often uh, talk, tell a story about my daughter. My daughter is now a big time attorney, works at, um, at uh, Wilmer Hale, used to be Hale and Door, big time firm. She was in high school, she gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of your power of attorney, the judge isn't like a real judge, you know, who's deciding whether it's valid. It's like the lady at the bank, you know, you're at the line and the teller is, you're showing him this power of attorney because your mother or your spouse, whatever, you, you need to sign for them. And the person's kind of looking at it going, ah, I don't know if this is valid, right? That's the reason why you want it to be relatively new because you don't want them to go, oh, this looks too old and you want to notarize it. It has been my experience, I've been practicing for 41 years now, just forever, and, and, and it has been my experience, there's something about a document with a notary seal. Everyone thinks it's valid, just by virtue of the fact that it has a notary seal. So you get the notary, not because that makes it valid, but because everybody thinks it's valid, if you have the notary seal. Um, with powers of attorney as opposed to proxies, you can name more than one person to act on your behalf. You can name a couple of people jointly if you want to make sure that everybody's working together. You can name them jointly and severally. So you can name your spouse and one of your kids, for example, so that if your spouse is up to it, your spouse can take care of it. Otherwise, if you've got a trusted child, the child can do it. Either or, either one of them can act, right? Jointly or severally. The, the next thing that you want to do, though, is once you've got those documents, is you want to talk to Christine. So Bay Path Elder Services, for those of you who don't know, is basically, um, it's, it is the nonprofit that is charged by both the state and the federal government with being the vehicle through which st state and federal dollars for your benefit are spent. Um, these, these, these entities, it's, it's called, uh, for federal purposes, something that has three A's in it, I don't know the name, for state purposes, the Aging Services Access Point, um, one of the original reasons for the organization was to take care of Meals on Wheels. Remember, Meals, there was, Meals on Wheels hasn't been there forever. It actually started at one point back in the 60s, and that was kind of the time at which a lot of this stuff happened. So you want to talk to Bay Path Elder Services. Christine has been running the organization now for a number of years, and I wanted her today to, to just talk about those services or things that may be of interest to you, right, as a senior who does not, who is still relatively healthy. Right. Christine. Thank you. Well, as Arthur said, my name is Christine Alessandro. I'm the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services, and our office is five minutes up the street, right over the line in Marlboro. And Bay Path has been around for just over 40 years. 
We originally started as a home care corporation and we serve 14 communities in Metro West. Now the one thing I want to really emphasize, although we may have the word elder in our name, <clears throat> you probably don't think I'm not elderly. You're right. We're going to use the term older adult because my confession to you is I'm going to be 60 in July. So I am going to be an older adult. So young. I am going to be eligible for everything I'm telling you about. And I listened to Arthur's presentations because I need to get my act together and start working on my health care proxy. This is our lobby area. <coughs> uh, we're, we're located at 33 Boston Post Road West, which if you go up right over the North Borough line, you have the 99 on one side of the street and you'll have our offices on the other side of the street. We're very close by. We, as an aging services access point, the state designation, we cover 14 communities in Metro West. So we go from Holliston in the south, we go all the way over to Natick, up to Wayland and Sudbury, and also serve Northboro, Southboro, and Westboro. But for purposes of the programs I'm talking about, I will be talking about, we sometimes go outside of our area. Arthur mentioned that we're an aging services access point. The other designation is Area Agency on Aging, a wow. AAA, and that is a federal designation. So one of the programs that you may wish to avail yourself of is a healthy living program. The, you don't have to be over 60 to take any of these programs. They're for anybody of any age. Healthy, all of our healthy living programs are known as evidence-based programs. That means in the scientific world, they have been proven to work. So it's an evidence-based program. So it's a program such as a matter of balance. We've had folks who are in their 30s and 40s take a matter of balance. They may perhaps have a little problem with their balance, may have a, a neurological disease that might make them more prone to falling. My Life, My Health is a chronic disease self-management program. Chronic diseases are arthritis, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, hypertension, pain. All of those are chronic problems that can interfere with your day-to-day -day life. The chronic disease self-management programs help you deal with those issues and learn to live with those chronic diseases and learn to live with them successfully so that they're not impacting you as much. We just happen to have a chronic disease self-management program starting on May 17th. It will be held, it's a six week program from 9.30 to noon at the North Borough Senior Center. There is a diabetes self-management program. So for folks who may have diabetes as a chronic disease, that's also very, very helpful. And we have a few healthy living programs for caregivers. Now, I'm a caregiver for my mother who is in her 80s and she lives in New Jersey. She lives by herself, but with the occasional fall or other issue, I do need to go running down to New Jersey and it can be very, very stressful. If anyone in here is a caregiver, perhaps for a loved one, whether it be a spouse, one of your parents, aunt and uncle, you know that can also be very, very stressful. So the two programs that we have for caregivers, the first is called the Savvy Caregiver, and the second is called Powerful Tools for Caregivers, which will give you the insight and training to be able to go through that caregiving journey with your loved one. These programs are free. We do ask that sometimes there's a cost to cover books for the chronic disease self-management programs, but usually we try and get that cost covered by other entities. They are available. All you have to do is call Bay Path's office. You don't have to attend the one in Northboro. You can attend one anywhere in the state. All the other regions in the state also have these type of healthy living programs. If you are a caregiver, and many folks might be caring for, as I said, either a spouse or parents, we have a special caregiver program that is funded by the federal government through our Area Agency on Aging. We have on staff a caregiver specialist. Her name is Alicia. And Alicia can offer training, education, support, and resources. Oftentimes in a caregiving journey, if you're caregiving for someone with dementia, 
it may be very helpful for you to know what the resources are in the community, in the next community, that may help you, not only in terms of your own health and emotional well-being, but in terms of the person that you are caregiving for, sometimes difficulty with behaviors. How are you going to cope with someone who doesn't want to get in the shower? Very common behavior problem. Also under our umbrella is dementia-friendly communities, which, which Arthur began to talk about. And Northboro is a dementia-friendly community. I started working with Arthur on this about four years ago. And the model that we have used in five of our communities so far is a model from Minnesota called Act on Alzheimer's. It's also known as Dementia Friendly America, where we engage the community. Actually, the community engaged the community. This came out of the senior centers. And the purpose is to have a community that is safe, engaged, and welcoming of folks with dementia and cognitive impairments. We've heard stories over and over again about how difficult it is to take out my spouse who has dementia to a restaurant because he can't focus, he can't make up his mind what he wants. Sometimes there's a behavior if there are things going on. But you want your community engaged and you want your community to be a place where someone can remain engaged in the social fabric. We often find that with caregivers, there's a very high rate of depression because the folks don't want to leave the house. So it was our intent to create dementia-friendly communities. So we have the Apple Cafe. We have, um, Carol has the Apple Cafe once a month, you talked about it. And Carol DiRienzo is my board president. So we're all in this together. Evidence-based programs for caregivers I just spoke about. And caregivingmetrowest.org is our caregiving website. CaregivingMetroWest.org will actually give you resources in 25 communities in Metro West for caregiving itself, whether it be to find another memory cafe, to find out what uh, attorneys might be available, home health resources are available. There's a blog, there's a wellness wall. It's a very comprehensive website, and if you're caregiving or not, I encourage you to go take a look at that website. Finally, what are you going to do once you're retired? My husband is actually talking about taking early retirement. And I figure after the summer is over, he's not going to know what to do with himself. He thinks it's going to be grand, and I know he's going to run out of projects. So we have a number of volunteer opportunities that will, can help you enrich your life, give back to the community. As Arthur mentioned, we're the Meals on Wheels people. Actually, the North Burr Senior Center is one of our meal sites. So we need delivery drivers, even if it's delivering once, once a week or twice a month. You get a set route. You deliver to the 12 or 13 or 9 people on that route. You get to develop a relationship with them. We reimburse you for your mileage. It's a win-win all around. So the person you deliver to gets a visit, and they get a hot meal. So vitally important. The second is our money management program. It's a volunteer program where we have individuals who are money management volunteers assisting an individual, an elder in their home with balancing their checkbook, writing out checks, organizing the mail, going through spam. And it's a very important service. Oftentimes, the fact that someone cannot manage their finances will often lead to long-term care for an individual because their finances can quickly spiral out of control. The third is ombudsman program. The ombudsman folks, their volunteers go to visit people in nursing homes. They make sure that the residents' needs are met, that their voices are heard. Area Agency on Aging Advisory Council, we are required by the federal government to have an advisory council. Most of our AAA money goes back out into the community for grants, such as transportation grants. We're helping to fund the Shudbury, Sudbury Shuttle. Uh, we fund legal services. We fund healthy living programs. We fund uh, cultural diversity programs. So, but we have an advisory council to really look at the needs of folks in our 14 communities and say, what should we fund this year? What are our priorities? 
And lastly, our board of directors. Bay Path is a private nonprofit organization. We are a 501c3. And we have a board of directors that is a governance board. So if you are interested in being involved in an opportunity to really look at a human services nonprofit organization and really be a part of change for the future, right now we're going through a strategic planning process. What is Bay Path going to do in the future? I offer up any of these opportunities to help you enrich your life and give back to the community. So I'm going to turn this back to Arthur. So in general, <clears throat> what I would suggest to you, no matter how old you are, right? Um, well, not no matter how old you are, but most of the people here are covered by that line. Um, talk to the folks at Bay Path. Give them a call. Just give them a call. Find out what they have to offer. Find out if there's something that is of interest to you. And if you have the time, decide whether or not you can actually contribute to that. Because a lot of the programs, as Christine has said, a lot of these programs run based on the fact that volunteers are available in order to do the programs. Now, a couple of other issues. Things that you want to be knowing about as a person who is, once again, getting a little bit older. <clears throat> tax deferral, real estate tax deferral. For many of my clients, uh, one of their biggest expenses in their lives, and like in Frank and Mary's case, is their house. Is their house. And most people don't realize that once you are over 62, or um, if you're married, if one of you is um, over, excuse me, no, if both of you are over 62 in that case, uh, if you've been living in North Road for the last five years, uh, if you've been living in Massachusetts for the last 10 years, then you are entitled to defer all of your real estate taxes. Uh, defer until when? Defer until you die. Defer until you die or you sell the house. Now, there, are, there is only one other requirement. There is an income requirement, right? Um, and, the, and Massachusetts says that no community can allow you to do this, um, or, or excuse me, that every community in Massachusetts has to allow you to do this if an individual's income is below $20,000. But above that, the income can go quite a bit higher than that. And for example, in Northboro, if you are a couple, you can defer your taxes if, you're combined, if your joint income is $40,000 or less, right? Which is not huge, but it's not nothing. So for a lot of folks who are retired, right, they may have assets, but they don't have a lot of income. In that situation, deferring your taxes may very well be one of your biggest bills and you have the right to do it. Um, the town will charge, it basically it is as if the town is giving you a reverse mortgage. Uh, and the town is charging you 8% interest. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, compound though, it's just 8% flat rate. And once again, it's due when you die or it's due if you sell the house. Speaking of reverse mortgages, um, another thing that you, should, that you may wanna consider, depending on what your financial situation is, is getting a reverse mortgage, especially getting it um, I want to say while you're younger, just to know that it is there. Now, whenever I talk about reverse mortgages, people go, oh, reverse, I've heard horror stories. They take your house, blah, blah, blah. Well, let me just talk about these for a second. So a reverse mortgage is a home equity loan. Everybody knows what a home equity loan is, right? You go to the bank and you say to the bank, I want to make this deal. Uh, I want to have a line of credit. I want to have a, basically a credit card that's going to be secured by my house. And I'm, in return for that, I'm gonna give you the bank a promissory note, a promise to pay back whatever I have borrowed together with interest. And the deal is, unless I borrow it, I don't owe anything on it. So the interest only starts accruing when I've actually borrowed the money. And then I'm gonna pay it back, and I'm gonna pay that money back. Typically, I'm gonna pay back the interest and monthly payments, but it's gonna then be due. There's gonna be a due date on this thing, and it's gonna be if I die, if I sell the property, or usually some period of time, oftentimes like 10 years. So that's, that is a home equity loan. What is a reverse mortgage? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You go to the bank or the reverse mortgage company uh, and the bank says, uh, and, and, they, and they will appraise your house to find out how much it's worth and they'll give you a percentage, they'll give you a line of credit for a percentage of the value of your house. And that percentage goes up the older that you get. And then, but the deal will be the same, that you, if, if you don't use this line of credit, then you know, there's no charge. If you do use it from the moment that you start using it, you start getting charged interest on the amount that you used. The only difference between that and the home equity loan 
is that every month, if you can't pay the interest, if you've got a cash flow issue, if you've had an emergency, for whatever reason, if you can't pay the interest, you don't have to. The failure to pay the interest is not a default under the mortgage. The interest in that case at the end of that month simply gets added to the remaining amount that you had borrowed, and so the following month you now owe a little tiny bit more because you owe more in principal and therefore your interest is going to go up a little bit. But the only times that you have to pay it are, like the home equity loan, if you die, although in this case is if you die plus a year, you have to pay it at least a year, within a year after you die, so that if you have a reverse mortgage, you die, your kids have a year basically in order to either refinance the mortgage if the kids want to keep the house or to sell the house and then pay the mortgage. And the amount that is owed, it's just like the home equity loan. It's the amount that you borrowed plus the amount of the interest. The only unusual case in a reverse mortgage is it's also due um, if you have been out of your house for 365 consecutive days for 365 consecutive days. So if you move to assisted living, if for some reason you have to go to a nursing home for whatever reason, what I always tell my clients is you've got one of these, you have to come back to your house one day a year. Have a celebration, enjoy the house, take a picture of yourself, maybe with a newspaper, since they still have newspapers, you know. So that they know you came back. But otherwise, otherwise, that's the reverse mortgage. So for example, in Frank and Mary's case, Frank and Mary, their house is worth $400,000. The two of them are 65 years old, so the age of the youngest, you, you can't get a reverse mortgage uh, in, unless at least one of the spouses is over 62. Um, the age of the youngest spouse is um, 65, the available line of credit would be $160,000, and if that weren't used, then every year it would go up. The, um, the unused line of credit it, it increases by usually between 2.5 and 5%. So that's reverse mortgages. Long-term care insurance. So, you're at the age where, well, maybe not everybody here is at the age, well, you may want to think about long-term care insurance. So let me talk about that for a couple of minutes. Um, you would think, based on the name, long-term care insurance, that the reason why you want to buy long-term care insurance is to cover your long-term care. And post, most people think of that as nursing home. And that's originally why these products got developed. At this point, though, the cost of the premium for a long-term care insurance policy to cover your nursing home care, the whole amount of your nursing home care would be very high because the nursing home care is so high. The cost of nursing home care around here now is about $12,000 a month plus, right? So $144,000 a year, round to $150,000. So the cost of buy, in, in, the, in the policy that you would want to buy would be a very expensive policy. So, so that, that's $12,000 a month, 30 days in a month, that's $400 a day. The cost of buying a $400 a day policy, that's a big number, right? On the other hand, of course, this policy you're buying is to, is to do something you don't want to do, right? If you were buying long, you don't want to be buying long-term care insurance to go to a nursing home. You don't want to go to a nursing home, right? However, what you really want is you want to stay home. And that's where the current long-term care insurance policies really have some value. Um, because you can buy a long-term care insurance policy that isn't this unbelievably expensive policy. Say you buy a policy that's going to pay $150 a day. Say as you get older, you either have, you have a fall, you develop some symptoms of, you have some dementia symptoms. For whatever reason, you can still be at home, but you need some help. You, maybe you need some help in the morning, getting up, getting ready. You need some help during the day, maybe making some meals, right? If you go to a, a private agency in this area right now uh, and say that you want to buy that care, that's going to cost you around $25 an hour, around. Now, that's not what the agency is paying the employee, but that's what you're going to get charged. So at $25 an hour, if you had a, a long-term care insurance policy that were paying $150 a day, that's actually six hours a day. That's six hours a day. That's for, in, in nursing home, terms, that's not a lot of money, but for, but for buying care that will allow you to stay at home, that can be really, really a useful thing. So you may want to think about it. Now, if you are over 70, it is less likely that you're going to qualify, but it is not impossible that you're going to qualify. If you're under 70, then it makes a lot of sense to look at these policies. If that is your concern, if that is your concern, it's one of the, obviously, buying all insurance it's a matter of, you know, it, it, how well are you sleeping at night? 
you sleep better knowing that if you've got a problem later on, this policy is going to show up, right? If you do, well, then it's worth buying the policy. So I guess consider that. Final reason to buy the policy, though, <clears throat> is, it, and this is true only in Massachusetts, as a result of an exemption that Massachusetts got from federal law a long time ago. Um, so if you look at, for this on Google, you typically don't find it, because it only applies here. Um, if you have a policy that will pay the nursing home from the, if you, that says that if you go to a nursing home, that it will pay the nursing home $125 a day or more for at least two years, and you own your home, and you go to the nursing home, and you want to qualify for Mass Health, your home will not be counted, your home will not be leaned, and there'll be no claim against your home following your death. So no matter, no matter what the value of your house, even if you just bought the house a couple months before you went to the nursing home, right? I do a, I do a lot of work um, in this area and also in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Thursday is always my island day. I have a lot of trouble explaining to my partners how hard it is working in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard in the summer. You know? but, it, but so there, I mean, Nantucket, there is no house that's worth less than a million dollars. This protects those houses, right? So, so if, in, if you're thinking, if you're Frank and Mary, and you're thinking to myself, in the long run, I really want to make sure I'm staying in my house, no matter what, then you may want to consider buying that policy. Um, now, I want to just, I want to end with, a, with, with three common myths. Things that you don't, th th three common myths. One, that you can't give your money away. Now, I know, you're, you know, you're, you're not thinking about giving your money away, but, but th this, you need to know this. So there is this, how many of you think that, that if you give away more than $15,000 a year, in a year to an individual, something bad happens? Anybody heard that? I mean, raise your hand, I dare you, raise your hand. It's wrong, it's wrong, that's a myth. You can give as much away to anybody that you want, any year, nothing bad happens. There is no Massachusetts, get, well, excuse me, Nothing bad happens unless your estate is worth more than $11 million. $11 million. Any, any $11 million? No. So, and, and because then there's something bad that happens if you give away a lot and you've still got more than $11 million. So, but I'm not talking about that because, because for Massachusetts purposes, there is no gift tax. The receipt of a gift is not income. So if you give something to your kids or to whatever, they're not paying any income tax on that, right? And the only real effect that it has is that it reduces your estate. One of the, one of the common estate planning tools that I talk to folks about you know, is you know, if, you're, if, if your estate is worth more than a million dollars, well, if you're Frank and Mary and your estate is less than a million dollars, none of this matters to you, but if your estate is worth more than a million dollars and you die and you're single and you leave that estate to other people, not to charities, then there's going to be a Massachusetts estate tax on it. And that estate tax can be pretty severe. The, 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 your estate, if your estate is worth a million dollars, there's no estate tax. Um, if your estate is worth a uh, million one hundred thousand dollars, there's an estate tax of forty thousand dollars. So the, on that last hundred thousand dollars, there was a forty percent tax on your on your money. So, so you may have an incentive. You may decide, well, not you, because of course you're going to be dead, right? But you may have an, your kids may really have an incentive to say, geez, you know, see if you can avoid this estate tax, right? Well, one of the things that you can do to avoid the estate tax is, you know, give somebody. Remember that power of attorney that you gave your daughter or your son, right? To so that he could, he or she could do whatever you know needed to be done for, prior to your death. Well, tell them. If I get really sick, you know, I was going to give it all to the three kids. Give it away before I die. If he gives it away before you die, and you had a million one hundred thousand dollar estate, and it gets it gives it away the day before you die, guess what? There's no estate tax because your estate is zero, right? So, so there, it, it's just a myth. If you hear, I think that I always say to, say to people, this is a myth perpetrated by CPAs. I know that's unfair to encourage you to file gift tax returns that you don't need to file, but that's a separate question. So, second myth, <clears throat> if you're Frank and Mary, right, if you're Frank and Mary and, you're, and you've got this estate plan, which is if one dies, it all goes to the other, and then it goes to the kids. The second myth is that in that situation, you need a revocable trust, right? Because many people will co come in and talk to me and they say, well, you know, my, my goal here is I really want to avoid probate. And so, 
Um, and all of my friends have told me that I gotta get a trust. And I'll tell them, I'll say, well, let's go through the assets. And now we can start going through the assets. And there's a house, and it's joint, and there's an IRA, and there's this, and there's going through all the assets. And I'll tell them, well, you know, if one of you dies, the other one just gets everything without probate. So is that what you wanna have happen? And typically they'll say yes, and I'll say okay. Well in that case, you don't need a revocable and amendable trust right now, right? When one of you dies, the other one should come and talk to me. Because at that point, if the surviving spouse then dies leaving things that are in their name, those assets are gonna to have to go through the probate process. And if you wanna avoid that, well then you may wanna create a revocable or amendable trust. But you don't have to do it ahead of time. Now, now the, as I always tell my clients, goal of life is to sleep well at night. My goal is to help you sleep. So if it makes you feel better knowing that if you both die simultaneously, that these things have been taken care of, well, then you can do that, right? And the older you get, the more you might say, well, we're not going to die simultaneously, but you know, one may die and then soon after the other. I've had that happen a lot. You know, most of my, many of my clients, not everybody's happily married, but many of my clients, their goal, you know, one of them dies, you, they'll tell you, you know, their goal to get to heaven, it isn't really you're gonna see God, it's I'm gonna see my wife again, I'm gonna see my husband again. So often, one will, spouse will die and the other will, spouse will die soon thereafter. So if you're worried about that, then take care of it. Finally though, and I think this is really important, there is no need to transfer your property to an irrevocable trust, unless you're single. I should actually say unless you're single or unless you have a cottage. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the next presentation because at the next presentation we're going to talk about dealing with issues if you're a senior and you have some physical or, or, or cognitive problems. So you just need more things. I think we want to be talking about many of the programs that are available through um, Bay, Path Senior, Bay Path Elder Services, specifically a program called the Frail Elder Waiver which is designed to help you stay home if you're in that situation. We're going to be talking about a lot of their programs. And we'll also be talking about this related kind of what's the planning that would be involved um, if, you are, if, you are, if you are married. But I'm just telling you as the, as the kind of the prelude to that, that if you are married and you need to qualify for one of these programs, you can just qualify almost right away. You don't need to have put property in an irrevocable trust and waited five years. You, you can qualify right away. So those are the myths. Um, if you've got any questions on any of this, um, uh, uh, Frank and Mary have their own Elder Law channel. It's Elder Law Frank and Mary on YouTube, and so you can go watch it again. And so I just want to, I'm going to end by just saying, you know, thank you very much for coming. This, we're trying to keep this program shorter. The next one will run about an hour. And once again, we're going to be talking about those issues that are involved if you are just, if you have more physical problems. So it's kind of like planning if you're not feeling so great, as opposed to here planning if you're feeling healthy. Any questions for either Christine or I, or me? Yes, sir. Sure. So, <coughs> sure. So, uh, can I explain the long-term care and the mass health lien? So, if if you're if you're Frank and Mary, and Mary needs nursing home care, right? She goes into a nursing home, um, and she wants to qualify for mass health, and they own their house. She can do it right away. She can own she because because as long as Frank is alive. First of all, if they own it jointly, that's okay. Um, and and if, she if she qualifies for mass health and dies before Frank dies, then Frank simply becomes the owner of the house and there is no mass health lien. If Frank dies first and then she owns the house when she dies, there is a lien, right? So that's a different issue. We're going to talk about that a little bit next month. But if she were single, if Mary were single and she went into a nursing home with those same assets that we saw, she'd need to spend down everything up except her house because she's allowed to own the house and be on Mass Health. But at that point, Mass Health will put a lien on that house. To, and, and the lien will say, following Mary's death, that Mass Health will, will get reimbursed for all of the money that they had paid on Mary's behalf, whether it was in the nursing home or if there was care that was given to her at home through the Sprail Elder Waiver Program, right? Except, if she goes to the nursing home, and at the time she goes to the nursing home, if she moves from her house to the nursing home, it's a very narrow thing, you gotta meet these little steps. She goes from the house to the nursing home, and she has previously bought this long-term care insurance policy. And that policy says that it pays $125 a day or more for at least two years, right? In that, and, and, and she goes to the nursing home, she then applies for MassHealth, 
And she puts that right in her application. She no longer says that she intends to return home, but she says, I've got a long-term care insurance policy, and you attach a copy. MassHealth will qualify her for MassHealth. MassHealth will be prohibited, though, from putting that lien on that, on that home. And following her death, even though normally MassHealth has a claim against the estate of a deceased to also get reimbursed for whatever was paid, they have no claim. That was, it was once again, it was, this was, this was, it's a very, it was a, 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 an exception that Massachusetts got from the federal Medicaid law in the 90s. It's the only state that has it, right? It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal, okay? Does that explain you? Yeah. Why two years? Why not the long-term care insurance will say six months? Why two years? Because that's what it says. <laughs> because that's what the exception said <clears throat> way back. And by the way, one other interesting piece about that, there, there used to be this, there was like a loophole um, that, that you, was used by MassHealth, God forbid they would use a loophole, that, that, that they, they, said, they said until about two years ago that when you got to the nursing home, all, 200, all two years worth of policy had to still be available, right? Not only did the policy initially have to be for two years, or se se technically 730 days, right? But you still had to have 730 days worth of coverage at the time that you went to the nursing home in order for the policy to save the house. And that was really important because, as I said, one of the main reasons why you buy these policies now is not for the nursing home coverage, it's for the home care. So a lot of people would have a policy and they would have used up a lot of the policy staying home. Then they get to the nursing home, oh my God, there's only like a month left worth of care. Now the house isn't safe. So that got changed, the legislature, in response to a lot of pressure from a lot, a lot of folks, a lot of the elder law attorneys, right, uh, and a lot of folks, changed that about two years ago to say that as long as the policy had two years' worth of coverage when you bought it, as long as it has one day's worth of coverage left, as long as it hasn't expired as a policy, when you go to the nursing home, it protects the house. So you can use 729 days' worth of home care Go to the nursing home, still have the policy, you saved your house. You say, and by the way, I just mentioned one other thing because for folks who are here, these folks are pretty young, but for people who may be watching at home, if you bought a policy before March 15th, I believe it's March 15th, 1999, either March or April, 1999, that the, the, the policy had to be for two years, but the amount was only like 50 or $60. It was much lower. So if you think you have this policy, and people will come to me, they say, I've got this old policy and it's just useless, you know? It's like it only pays like 60 bucks a day and the nursing home's 400. And I'll tell them, I say, yeah, except that that saves your house. That saves your house. As long as that policy has got a day on it, right? It saves your house. Any other questions? I didn't mean to be, but that's kind of an, it's an important one. Most people have no idea this exists. Yes, sir? And if you, it is, and if you pay more than 15,000, what happens? Nope, nothing happens. The, the, so I'll, so I'll, I have a few extra minutes, so I'll, I'll just give you, so remember the $11 million, right? So at the, at the federal level, in the Massachusetts, there's no gift tax. The federal level, there's a combined gift and estate tax. And the way the system works is, if you have an estate, which now, if you're single, is more than $11 million, right? you pay a federal estate tax. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're married and you don't use your 11 million, then it goes to your spouse. When your spouse dies, she, her exemption is actually $22 million, right? If you care. But the point is this is $11 million. Now, as part, as, in order to keep people from trying to avoid that by giving away all their money at the last minute, just like I just explained, right? The federal level, they adopted a gift tax. And they said the way the gift tax works or it's a combined federal and gift tax system. So if you make a gift in one year to one person of more than $15,000, what you're supposed to do is tell the federal government you did it, right, by filing a gift tax return the following year. And on the gift tax return, all there is is like this little, it's like a math problem. You know, you just, you take your, you know, you, you, you report, oh, I gave $115,000 to my daughter, minus $15,000, which is this year's amount that you can give. It used to be 10, but it's gone up with inflation. So this other $100,000, I am telling you the federal government, you should, you should subtract from the $11 million that I can otherwise give away at death. So now I can only give away $10,900,000 at death. So that's the long story. So that's why the short answer is 
So it doesn't make any difference. You know, it just doesn't make any difference. Okay? That answer your question? I thought I saw one other question. No? Yes, sir? And then we're done. I have a long term care insurance. I got it on the ground floor in 2002. The problem is that I don't have more than one uh, assisted living. Uh, uh, you, don't, you don't need assistance with more than one of the activities of daily living today. Is that what you were going to say? Well, no, it varies by policy. You can just go back and read your policy. Most policies require two or more. Yeah, it says two, unless you have dementia. That's right. It, you, it, either the, the rule usually is, but once again, whenever people call me with a long-term care insurance policy, I say, read the policy. There are no kind of official rules about any of this part, right? So the policies vary. It's usually at least two activities of daily living or you need uh, regular supervision in order to, for your own safety. Yeah, so and because you don't because you don't need assistance with two of the activities of daily living but for what it's worth if you're single and you have a house and you end up going into a nursing home your house is now safe right that's the good who would have known so don't let that policy expire right and don't use it all up keep one day so Christine thank you very could I just have a quick round of applause for my friend Christine Alessandro Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, Chris, for coming. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in about a month. June 18th. June 18th. We'll see you on June 18th, same time, same place. Thank you.